Welcome to the Salt and Mirrors and Cats podcast, interviews and audio dramas from our literary zine with stories, poems and art about superstitions. In this season, you will hear tales of superstition and exclusive interviews with the founders of the zine, along with four mystery guest writers. In today's episode, we'll hear from co-founder Joanna Veranda and her story, The Purple Cloak, with voice acting by Joanna Swan. Co-founder Sanyamana asks Joanna Veranda a question. Joanna, what does superstition mean to you? I have a rather odd view about superstition. I'm obviously aware that it has a very troubled history, though I feel drawn to the positive aspects of it especially those that relate to traditions and beliefs passed on through generations. The general consensus is that superstition is an irrational belief, and many people will often say that they don't believe in superstition. But it's interesting to think that many of us hold on to family heirlooms and other types of objects in hope of guidance and protection. It seems a natural human occurrence. The essence of museums, for instance, is to collect objects that have meaning to someone. But from an existential perspective, nothing has meaning, so why do it? That's why I see superstition as a sense of place and belonging. When I went through a tough time in life, I coped by going through my earliest memories in Portugal to figure out who I really was. I remember, vividly, standing by my grandmother's front door as a kid and opening an umbrella and being hilariously told off. I also remember my grandfather's propensity to the collecting of charms, how he always carried acorns in his pockets. I was surprised to find that people in the UK also have that belief, that carrying an acorn in your pocket might help you stay young or protect you from lightning. That was when I began to see superstition as a type of hope and feeling of safety, something that can improve mental well-being and help us connect with some of the things that matter most in life, like family or community. What was the inspiration behind your story? The Purple Cloak was inspired by events that took place in my childhood. I used to see a woman wearing a purple cloak standing at the foot of my bed, and when I told my mother, she took me to see a witch. For many years, I felt like this event had cursed me, and I sought desperately to somehow be... cured. Until I discovered who that woman might have been, after I inherited a purple cloak from my father's mum. She passed away after childbirth complications, and never got to be a mother herself. Comprehending at last how much she had suffered when I reached a certain age, I stopped to see my grandmother as a being that had been out to get me, and instead saw her as my protector, leading me to want to share her story. I wrote the purple cloak for the first time during my bachelor's in creative writing, and the feedback I received was that I had a talent for making the unnatural natural. That gave me the strength to continue to write, and I attempted to submit it to a few zines, but in the following months, I had to change it quite a few times to fit word counts. When I finally received an acceptance, I was quite terrified to see beta readers consider the mother to be the hero of the story. And I ended up changing my mind and pulling out of that scene. Then, Ghost Lore, a series of episodes by the Alternative Stories and Fake Realities podcast came along at just the right time giving me a chance to condense the story once more. Unfortunately, it wasn't an acceptance on that occasion, which led me to feeling quite defeated and wondering once more about the power of my curse. One night, I woke up at 3am, wondering what to do, and I thought, well, maybe I could create my own zine. And that's when the name came to me, Salt and Mirrors and Cats because I am so fascinated by superstitions and their potential to connect with family and the landscape. 
Looking back, I think the purple cloak was also a metaphor for being neurodivergent, as my mother sought to change me instead of accepting me. That is also my purpose with this scene, I think, to demonstrate that neurodivergent people can create something beautiful and worthwhile, but even so, that our value as human beings isn't measured by whether we can accomplish something or not. I am so grateful to Joanna Swan for reading my story, and thank you everyone for your interest in Salt and Mirrors and Cats. The Purple Cloak by Joanna Veranda Read by Joanna Swan When I was a child, I used to see a lady hunched at the foot of my bed. She would wake me up in the middle of the night with a rustling of linen and sobs and stare at me. Whenever I asked her to leave, my mother came in. Mother, I would say, there is a lady wrapped in a purple cloak at the foot of my bed. It's only a nightmare, go back to sleep, she'd retort. But what do you call nightmares when they follow you into the day, entombed in mirrors, reflections behind you? Would the lady ever speak, state, tell me who she was? She would not. They would not. My father hung linen bags of lavender on my bedpost and said nothing. My mother took the bags from the bed and took me to see a witch instead and said nothing. I was supposed to forget, never say anything again. But I could not. The witch lived in a labourer's neighbourhood, burrowed at ground level of a thirties building, door ajar with a serpentine queue. It stretched beyond the cul-de-sac of three-floor structures, inchmeal smother through labyrinths of cars hastily left on pavements. No tree, no shade, nor shelter in sight, for the cortege of believers that carried on undazzled by the torrid sun. Near afternoon's end, the witch and the mother converged at last, and it was decided I should be taken to a room at the back of the flat. Bound to a stretcher fringed by yellow walls and effigies of Christian saints, I watched as they poured olive oil and water onto a glass held above me. I watched as round and round the liquid sloshed, held together, not splitting, a sign of the evil eye. Then prayers uttered, wishes made and incense lit, camphor overpowered me and I could remember no more. The contemptible forces that haunted me gone. Everything. Gone. I never saw a ghost after that. Purple cloak and sobs and bitter aftertaste of camphor permeating me, us, just out of sight. I wanted to know she was still there, somewhere, perhaps at the foot of my bed, unable to move, existence fixated on me, so I pursued spiritual interests, tarot, seances, occult rituals. Nothing I ever did worked, and when I attended public gatherings, nothing ever appeared for anyone else. I read about folklore and superstitions, and discovered that one may carry lavender to see ghosts. I remembered the linen bags my father would hang on my bedpost and made numerous ones again, for my pockets, for my bed, for my walls, and yet... Nothing. Nothing but the scent of camphor. Until the day that my mother abandoned us, and I realised I had not been cursed before. Standing in that yellow room of empty figures after being left to fester outside, the evil eye had stared straight at the witch, and she had not stared back. Instead, she had stoked it. 
due to lack of skill or propensity to align with the wrong forces, I could no longer tell. It had been too long. Too long since my mother had begun to place boxes of powder under our beds, poppets at the back of cupboards, and paper curses frost-bitten in freezers, supplied by the peddler herself. In shock, I journeyed north with my father to our ancestral home, hoping that the scent of tall mountains and trees would permeate us instead. The forgotten house stood at the bottom of a wooded valley, flanked by faraway lavender fields and streams of pure, crystalline water. I have longed to be here again, my father whispered, at last cleansed by the aroma of the purple flowers of his childhood. I sighed and hugged him. Your grandmother would have loved you very much. What happened? She died giving birth to me. She never got to be a mother. I think she would have wanted you to have her things. Come with me. Taking a key from a peg on the wall, my father led me to a door around the back of the house, opening to a flight of stairs and an attic, above the rooms we were now able to peacefully sleep in. Illuminated by a small skylight, we saw that there was but an iron trunk in this crawling space. I opened it, immediately enveloped by a calming scent of lavender. There was just a large parcel at the bottom, wrapped in linen turned yellow with age and held secure by a ribbon. Held taut by the ribbon was a sprig of lavender too. I undid the ribbon, trembling, feeling as if camphor and curse were ebbing away for inside the parcel was my ghost's belongings. Inside the parcel was a purple cloak. And she finally smiled. Thank you for listening to the Salt and Mirrors and Cats podcast. The story you heard today was The Purple Cloak by Joanna Veranda, with voice acting by Joanna Swan. We would also like to express our gratitude to everyone who contributed to our fundraiser earlier this year. Thanks to your support, submissions to the Salt and Mirrors and Cats zine are now completed. Please see our show notes for more information and updates. Salt and Mirrors and Cats. We'll share the good luck. <laughs>